stay hungry, stay foolish. Our guest today presents a practical approach to ensure that employees perform at their highest possible levels. It's not about increasing salaries, offering huge bonuses, or inventing the latest employee engagement tools. The real answer is simpler, deeper, and longer lasting. Getting your people to love where they work. Our guest takes us step by step through the process of building a lasting emotional connection between your staff and your company. His proven strategy is founded on five key principles. Collaboration, optimism, values, respect, and performance. Fuse them together and your company will be the envy of your industry. This groundbreaking guide provides everything you need to create an environment where people have a strong sense of belonging, a place where people finally feel like they're part of something big, where employees want to work collaboratively and creatively, where your staff and your company grow together. Bridge the engagement gap by ensuring that every member of your team spends their entire workday in great company. We welcome author of In Great Company, How to Spark Peak Performance by Creating an Emotionally Connected Workplace. Lewis Carter, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. You start the book by explaining what you mean by In Great Company. Being in great company is the place where you want to go to work, where you can be yourself, whether that's challenging supporting, mirroring, moving to decisions. We're a place where work gets done rather than waiting and there's politics and bureaucracy. It's a place where people really feel a sense of belonging and exciting to execute on real things every day. Yeah, and I thought to put things in context, I'd read out what you call the sound of apathy in the workplace. And these are the things that make people feel disconnected and you put together this list of quotes that goes like this. My manager sends me directions, but doesn't provide me any details. So I'm left to read his mind. He gets angry then when I don't understand him. I received a high rank on my annual performance review, but I don't know if anything about my work is actually having an impact. I think our business is doing well, but I don't know what we stand for and what our strategy is. It feels empty. These are common things that happen, people, and this is what you call the sound of apathy in the workplace. It'd be great to describe this issue before we look at some solutions. One of the greatest failures of leaders is thinking that everybody else can read your mind without giving direction or any kind of what we call feed forward, a positive future feed forward for what they should be accomplishing. Companies have hundreds of years of branding sometimes, the Fortune 500 companies. When you come into a system like that, you immediately have to understand all the branding and knowledge and, and information. It takes a long time to do that. And once that becomes part of your DNA, you can have some expectations. However, it takes a long time to build up that muscle to get to that point when you have those expectations with other leaders with you. I thought it would be useful to give people an idea of what connectedness feels like, the emotion of connectedness, and you call upon social connectedness first to kind of give a, a parallel from what this feeling can be in the workplace. And you talk about social connectedness, and you yourself find this in drumming. People often think of emotional connectedness as some sort of ethereal or magic thing that happens. I looked at you across the bar and I saw you and I locked eyes with you. Immediately knew that you were the one I wanted to be with. So everyone's going to think about I feel of it really that way. Special. Thanks, man. Oh, <laughs> sorry, we're still on there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we still on the air? The truth is that there's a currency to emotional connectedness. And there's two types of currency. There's a respect currency and there's a social currency. What does that mean? Well, respect is when you and I talked on the phone, we're respectful of each other when we talk first. Perhaps there is something across the room you could tell that there would be a glance that says to you that you are being respected by being looked at. Now, some people don't give eye contact as easily and just for whatever reason. And that doesn't mean we should discount that experience. The concept of emotional connectedness as magical or only feeling oriented is wrong. Uh, it's based upon giving respect, getting respect, and also giving social currency. Where my life is better as a result of having you in it, and your life is better as a result of having me in it. Before we jump into the five elements of EC, you mentioned there are three foundations required, leadership, culture, and structure. 
Exactly. So when you look at it from a systemic point of view for an organization, uh, you, you have those kind of building block elements, and, and they're known inside of a company for organization design. The most important part, though, is in the conversations we have around sparking peak performance. It all comes down to conversations, and a lot of companies that have a more general uh, purpose in mind, which sometimes is just to be the leader in their industry, right? How general can you be or to achieve a certain uh, shareholder value. So what do you do in those cases? You have to work on people. So when you work on people and the communication and you reduce dysfunction, which comes in so many ways and secrecy, not coming to conclusions. This is the place where you've, you've taken one and a half years to create one line of code because nobody could agree on it and nobody could create that app that everybody wanted to do, even though it was an awesome idea to do. And you were the one who had the idea along with three of your colleagues and no one could get it done because it just didn't get the right visibility. Perhaps it would have made millions of dollars, but it just kept going in circles, in political circles, right? So that's part of the structural elements of it that need to be worked out. The communication elements of Spark are pretty cool. Let's try it. You ready for this? Let's do one. All right, so this is what it is. So there's a video I did on this as well, but I'd like to do Spark with you. So Spark is this. It's systemic collaboration positive future, aligning values, respect, and killer outcomes. So we'll do one. So I'm going to ask you some questions, and then I'm going to repeat back what I think you said in a way to introduce you. And we'll do the same thing. Okay, here we go. Okay, just, just <laughs> to say, I'm going to edit it if I sound bad. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> if I sound bad, if I sound bad, you should edit it out too. No, no, no. You'll sound great. I know. That's the whole point of Spark, actually, is that when you begin this, this, you have the intention that you are helping and advertising and marketing and branding and giving great appreciation for that individual that answers these questions. And they, they, therefore, you create their spark for you, and I create your spark for you. So everybody has a spark. The key is in who lights it and who will ignite it. Because in, I'll, I'll, I'll use that as a, as a context behind this, because in many social systems and situations, it's much easier to talk about others than it is about yourself, especially in beginning exercises or when getting to know somebody. So in networking events, this is really great to do. So let's, would you like to try it? Yeah, let's do it. So tell me, how do you collaborate within a system? I would reach out to the collaborators and firstly agree what we want to achieve and perhaps the ways we're going to work together. How about creating a positive future? How do you create a positive future as a leader in a, in a great company? Start with a vision and communicate that vision. Now, I'm biased here because I've read your book, but I'd always have a vision for whatever project I'm working on. That's awesome. I like that too. Vision is critical to overcoming <laughs> resistance, right? So let's go to the A, aligning values. What's the way that you align your personal values with that of a company? What are your values and how do you align that with a company? Fairness is big for me. Family, honesty, hard work, discipline, and community. Those are awesome values. And tell me about how you respect others and expect to be respected. I have to practice what I preach to my children and I tell them that if they bend back the ruler, it's going to snap back on them. So in other words, treat others like you would like to be treated yourself because the universe works that way. Love it. Karma. <laughs> Let's go to killer outcomes. What kind of killer outcomes or just awesome outcomes, killer outcomes are you looking for in your life or uh, in your company? I think you need to be passionate about what you do and curious about what you do in order to give it 100%. So when people feel they're achieving what we agreed way back in the vision, and that we're working together, amazing things can happen. Absolutely. So let's so let's look at you. Let's look at your spark for a second. Your spark 
is that you value co-creating with people and allowing them to be part of what you're you're doing and your vision. You like to have strong visions for a r- amazing future. And what you're doing is your values are to cre- do this through community, belonging, a great sense of self, and real respect for each other. You expect that respect from others because you expect it of yourself. And the way you do that is you you have rulers or outcomes that you know if somebody goes over it, snaps back at you, just like you said for your children and your family. Nice. (laughs) And then you want outcomes to be geared toward what it is that will help you and others in a way that helps the community as well as you. So you're, you're not selfish. And you know that if you do unto others, others will do unto you. So you understand the value of karma within your killer outcomes. Nice, man. You have an incredible spark in you and in your whole system as a human system is one that's geared toward real respect for yourself and others, like true respect for yourself and others. And that will get you, has already gotten you really far. Nice, man. I like that. I'll take that. I'll chalk that one down. (laughs) (laughs) That's it. That's the spark in you. Before we go deeper into systematic collaboration, let's share the biggest collaboration killers. Here you mention political maneuvering and bullying, and you mentioned the work of Tom Kolditz. Tom is the ultimate example of a leader who really destroyed bullying as a tactic to allow for the Korean augmentee soldiers and U.S. soldiers to become more effective on the battlefield. The situation was this. The U.S. soldiers were basically making fun of the Korean augmentee soldiers because of their differences in war tactics. So Tom recognized this because there were many errors on the field, and that means lost lives. So what Tom did was immediately stop this kind of bullying behavior, and he made one of the Korean augmentee soldiers his driver, which was one of the most coveted positions for a brigadier general. And he also gave opportunities and had U.S. soldiers come over to the Korean augmentee soldiers' dojos and homes to have dinner, a nice Korean male, experience their lives. And in that effort, in his interventions there, allowed for and gave opportunities for U.S. soldiers to really respect and admire Korean soldiers for their differing tactics and strengths as soldiers and thus improved their morale greatly, reduced bullying greatly, and also made them one of the highest performing missions in the U.S. Army. And this is under the title of equal airtime, so including others, giving them the opportunity to speak up, etc. And you talk about three archetypes that usually destroy meetings and destroy collaboration. So easy. And you know the person in the room who does this. It's that person who is constantly talking, constantly pontificating. And when it's the leader, you know you're probably in the wrong room. One of the things that I always do inside of a room is I speak last. And you've heard of the book, Leaders Eat Last. Well, I speak last. And if I don't, that means that I can't hear what everybody is thinking and what they've gone through in a room. So imagine I just speak up. I say the things that I know need to happen and it just has to happen this way. There is times like that that needs to happen where I say things that need to, that are they're tactical or required in the moment. However, most of the time when you're inside of a great meeting, inside of a meeting that is functional, you're hearing what everybody is their internal hearing their internal dialogue what's going through your head right now this guy you know is this guy talking too much is he connecting to me too much and i say give me some feed forward on what i'm saying so i know what you're thinking so and we do that in groups so if you present you get feed forward from everybody so a group of 12 a group of 50 200 there's ways of getting feedback from those rooms in different ways so you don't have to hear from every single person the 200 you can create quorum in a group of 200 through eight people working in a group, four people working in a group, in dyads, all reporting out. So the whole room has this sense of of ubiquitous awareness. Everybody understands it and are aware of it. And when they leave that room, they say, wait a second, why are you speaking or talking like that? We just agreed that it wasn't like that. Or they have in- pattern interrupters. Why are you speaking like that? We agreed not to speak like that, right? So it, it, this is the way great cultures are made is through hearing and, and agreeing and having uh, really a, a belief that we're, we're helping each other rather than trying to harm. 
And I love here something you mentioned that really shocked me. 83% of mergers fail. And I thought that was unbelievable statistic. And one of the things that you say that many leaders fail to do is take what's called a listening tour. Yeah, every leader I, I speak with, that's the very first thing we do. They say first 90 days. I say, what's your, what are you going to do? You're going to do a listening tour. Key Bank is one of them in my book. The very first thing they did was listening tours. I have uh, people I work with now in a hospital system, healthcare system, uh, who take listening tours. What's important in listening tours is that you do it with two questions in mind. Because you don't want to go in saying, what's going wrong here? Why is this so screwed up? Imagine coming in and someone says that to you, like or your doctor comes in the room, your doctor says, what is going on with you? That looks so sinister on top of you. How did you get that to happen? Is your diet horrible? You know, horrible bedside manner. You say, well, what have you been doing really well inside your life, inside your company? And what could be done better? You frame it in that way, which is called an appreciative mindset for listening tours. Things change completely. You disarm people with appreciative questioning. When you collect that information and you create your kind of slide deck, if you will, for what you've learned, what you end up doing is presenting a positive future to people. So example of this was at Best Buy. Hubert Jolie, great example. Hubert had an awesome vision when he was brought in by Jim Citron from Spencer Stewart because what happened was Best Buy at the time, all these other companies were falling off the charts like Circuit City and the ones like Amazon and were sticking in because people were coming in to Best Buy and they were looking at stuff and they said, this looks real cool. And they take out their iPhone and they take it to their and they take out the uh, barcode scanner, up, and they open it up, and then here comes Amazon, here comes eBay, I'm going to go home and buy it. Hubert knew this was happening. So when he was interviewed for that position of CEO, he came in and he said, look, I have a vision for you. What you need to do is be more than a showcase to, pe- to customers. You need to help them. You need to be their lifeline. You need to be their customer service center. And their, people's eyes opened up. He says, you, you, you guys are great at being a showcase appreciatively. You guys are great at having awesome products. What you need to do better is be customer's best friend, thus the geek squad. And that's really what differentiated Best Buy and enabled them to be still on the market, if, if not one of the biggest players in electronics today. You talk about another element here of systematic collaboration and it's the free flow of information. Much, much information in businesses is in silos and it's not joined up thinking. And businesses could succeed so much if they just shared the information and people didn't feel threatened by doing so. Absolutely. When you think about government systems in particular, government systems hoard information typically because they themselves want to be the one who won specific cases or they want to be the ones that unearthed certain elements. It's not untrue of Fortune 500 sector in that we politicize information because information is knowledge. Knowledge is, well, to power. And thus, when you have that kind of knowledge and you can create a certain outcome, you're not going to tell people typically. It's it's not human nature to share when you're not given something in return. Thus, the social currency, right? Give something and get something. So we have to begin to think of relationships in that same way. It doesn't sound very nice. It sounds like, well, aren't friendships friendships? Can't you just be a friend to someone? Eh, I don't know about that. (laughs) These days, you really, and inside companies, it's not about friendships. It's about giving and getting, really. And you have to understand what you need and what you can give. Thus, you're going to, it breaks down these barriers once you understand what somebody needs and what you can also give as a result. And it differs in different ways. It may be respect in some ways. It may be respect in listening about somebody's family or what they're going through in their family. It could be the fact that you just need to understand where they're coming from and what a bad day they had. Uh, It it could be that uh, they do need to have that beer at the end of the day with you or go to their cookout. So these kinds of things can be as simple as that as a currency or as complex as perhaps allowing somebody 
somebody to put their software product into a major system because they themselves will have more professional gain. There's varying degrees of sociopathy, if you will, to one's requests. I don't judge either request, whether it's somebody wanting a beer or somebody wanting financial gain or political or power gain. That's your want or your gain. At the end of the day, And in the end of your life, you're probably going to say, did I get this? Did I do this? And if it's not there and you you didn't go toward that goal, well, you're going to be a little upset. (laughs) So so if you if you didn't define your life that way, get what you needed to get there. Well, I'm sorry. You you, you go get them. And and so if, if it's just beer and family, thumbs up. If, if, if it's uh, to make a certain amount of money, thumbs up too. I'm not going to judge you. Yeah. And I like that, man, because, you know, people often feel defined by other people's visions. And I often feel sorry for people who go into business based on what they think their parents want them to do or their friends, et cetera. And instead of doing what you talk about in the book, like define your own values, use the Spark framework if you want, but define your own values and then look for jobs that can give you satisfaction towards those values, and then you're going to have a happier life. There's this big movement called conscious capitalism. You've probably heard of it with John Mackey starting it out at Whole Foods and, you know, Patagonia uh, moves forward in that. Now, Braska, EM and uh, Tata and KPMG are joining in this kind of UN global compact movement and around sustainability and social responsibility. There are massive amounts of people in, in, in younger generations that really love these movements. And again, I'm saying I'm, I'm coming from a, an outside perspective. I'm not politicizing it in any way. I'm saying movements and beliefs and values are great customer driven centers are great employee branding centers. Patagonia, look at them. I mean, they they put out an ad during Christmas. They said, don't buy our clothes. We don't want more conspicuous consumption. What happened? Everybody bought their clothes. <laughs> it's because they, you know, they, they respected their constituents. And what did they do? They, you know, at Patagonia, if they want to go surfing one day, what are their employees going to do? They're going to go surfing. They're not going to come in. And, and then they bring their longboard to work. People are like, cool. You know, Joe went surfing. Hey, cool. Sarah, Susan went surfing. No big deal. The boss, the CEO, he's not going to be mad at you for doing that. And you talk about this as a key part of business in general, flexibility and for systematic collaboration, a mix of structure and flexibility is core. And you mentioned here squads, tribes and chapters. I'd love if you shared this. I'd love to. So let's talk about the tribe. So Gary Ridge from WD40 has an awesome way of leading inside of his company. It's really a community. It's a family. And when I was over there, I got a chance to become friends with Stan Sewich. He's the CHRO of the company. And one of the things that I learned was that when employees are having a tough time at home or th- things were a little bit difficult, the whole company comes around to help that person. So it, they had somebody in the break room who was having some trouble with their child who was ill. And everybody started a big donation box for them. And then they gave this person a month off so he could care for his child. And it's this kind of tribal mentality that we are only as good as our help for each other that drives company cultures. And WD-40, look what they have achieved and where they've come as a company with, uh, you know, such a, a defined product. And they've been, a, they've been a living company for so long, largely because of this tribal culture and, and because Gary was able to allow for agility and more innovation for their company. Yeah, and while we're on that one, I'm going to jump a little around with the Spark framework here because you talk later on about respect, the ore of the Spark, and this just reminds me of it. And you talk about the amazing story of Howard Schultz of Starbucks in the early day when he was only 34 year old as a CEO, when one of his staff members came to him with a crisis. Yes, this was a an incredible story, and it was Howard Bahar and Howard Schultz, and one of his staff members came to him and explained that he was going to die, he was going to die of AIDS. And they didn't know what to expect from this meeting. He sat down and a tear came down Howard Schultz's eye. So it's at this very moment in any leader's life when they are tested, 
They say, you could do one of two things. You could do something amazing and great for this person, which may actually cost you a lot of money because at the time they didn't have much money. They were, it was at the beginnings of Starbucks. So he ended up saying, saying to this individual, you are not going to leave us. We're going to let you have a job until your dying days. We're going to give you health care until your dying days. We're not going to let you go. You are part of us. And in that very moment, that story resonated throughout Starbucks. It resonated throughout the communities. And Starbucks became a community shop. It became a place where you didn't just take care of yourself. You took care of others. You took care of others in your, your company. And you took care of your customers in a way as well. There's a customer there who was an older gentleman who came in every day toward the end, end of his life in his 90s. And he was from a, he was, there was an older age home, a convalescence home across the street. He came in every day and they'd say, hello, how are you? And everyone would rally around him. They loved him so much. And they'd, you know, they'd talk to him and they'd sit down with him and, and have a cup of coffee even with him. And, you know, they would just be excited that he was there and he felt at home there. And the staff, after a while, they saw he wasn't coming in for a week or two. He, where, where did he go? So they went across the street to the home. They said, where did he go? Where is, we haven't seen him around. Where, is he go? where did he go? He said, well, he, he passed. The next day, he had a funeral. And the manager of Starbucks that day let everybody out paid to go to the funeral. So everybody was part of this man's life. And they became part of his family part of the end of his life, meaning. It's these kinds of connections that we forge with others that just brings us to a completely different level of love for work and love for community. In this age of digitization and automation and artificial intelligence, the more the world becomes digital, the more we need to be human. And it's great to hear these great stories that can inspire people. I'm going to jump back to Vision now, and you mentioned Gary Ridge and the success of the company with not so much of a sexy product, oil. I mean, it's oil, man, you know, but he manages to keep that positive future alive and in everybody's bloodstream within the business. And here you introduce the element of positive future with another business that's not so sexy, but does amazing things to ignite people throughout the business, which is Big River Steel. Yes, yes. So here's what's interesting. Like Harley Davidson, Big River Steel was always trying to sort of create a new culture. They're in Arkansas. They're a tech company. You know, they're near the Mississippi River. What do you do? How do you get people from, you know, here to there, right? So it was highly innovative. The key to this, this initiative at Big River Steel was an individual empowerment. One of the top things or top success factors of any great change initiative is to fund it. So they spent over $10 million on training for individual empowerment. And the CEO basically said that the leadership team believes in this, specifically empowering the workforce so they feel comfortable carving their role in the company and developing whom they become as individuals. Imagine that for a second. They, he really cares about who they become as individuals. So he, he looked at that individual empowerment figure, knew that if they're empowered, the, the, the company becomes empowered. So uh, it, it became part of their DNA. And they were future-oriented. So meaning, what I mean by future-oriented, when CEOs invest in building facilities, a big CEO at the Bupula, he invested... $1.3 billion to build a facility in energy environmental design, which is LEED certified. So he's showing that he has basically, if you look at that, that's conscious capitalism right there. It's a lot of money goes toward conscious capitalism. You're familiar with LEED. It's a rating system for to track environmental performance. So, you know, it, it's, it's really a lot of money to put into LEED. He didn't have to do that. And, and it became a model for utilizing AI, artificial intelligence. They partnered with startups. So right away, you know why they did that, right? <laughs> More talent, potential for acquisition, more talent. They're in San Francisco, they, who installed thousands of sensors 
that delivered like next gen data, helped them become the first smart steel production facility. Right there, investment in future, becoming a smart steel production facility, backed by AI, really smart strategic decisions. He's equipped to monitor, improve, and improve maintenance planning. Again, not sexy thing to do, but he made it into sexiness, right? A little maintenance planning, production line scheduling, logistics ops, safety, environmental protection. So we're a technology company, but we happen to make steel, right? So he he turned something that is just a steel company into a full-fledged, future-focused, environmentally friendly, artificial intelligence-backed production facility. So who are we going to buy from? Big River Steel, <laughs> right? Who are we going to buy from? The guy, the, the guys who, who don't invest in these amazing technologies for the future that will be living for the next 150 years? Or the other one is just geared toward uh, running people in, into the uh, ground to make, the, to make steel? You talked about them investing so much in their people in order to upskill them. And th- this is one of the things that we need to realize in the world. A recent IBM report came out and it said 120 million workers will need to be reskilled because of the impact of artificial intelligence. So the business environment has changed immensely. And we're still expecting people in the or- in organizations to be able to operate when the business operated business environment has changed. And it reminds me of an Einstein quote that is, we cannot solve our problems with the same level of thinking that created them. So we have to train people to think differently. So you mentioned naysayers in business. I thought this was really good because so many businesses are really trying to transform. They're trying to update the mental operating system of the business, but people within the business can hold them back and out of fear. And it's, I, I don't think anybody's inherently bad. Yes, 1% of the, the world are psychopaths, but there's not that many of them throughout, spread throughout organizations and people hold back innovation all the time. But you mentioned the policy of yes and, and the institutional yes of Amazon. Yes, yes and. Uh, so so, so th- there's neuro-linguistic programming or NLP in those two words. They're very powerful, yes and. If you look at how a statement is formed when you're giving somebody feedback, usually people say, they typically say something like, you know, I really I really thought that was great what you did and it seem, seems like you, you will put a lot of a lot of hard work in it, but you know it just didn't hit me right, and I just don't think it should happen again. Something like that, right? So you didn't hear anything about what they did really well because the but just negated the first part of the sentence that they worked hard and they kind of liked what they did, and then you gave a really vague statement as to what they should be doing better. You know, at Amazon and yes, other companies that have done this, there there are others about how do we give fee forward. Uh, GE and I mean is a huge example, but there's there's other smaller ones that that we mentioned, and it's not so much about the company. I think that it is about the individuals using this kind of NLP and uh, the effect that it has. So uh, it, it's about having a butt jar. Every time you say but, because you just negated something that you said that may have been very helpful or something that really you should remember more of. We focus too far, far too much on the things that we feel and others feel are bad about us. And thus we feel bad about ourselves, creating a cycle of negativity that we give to others, as you said in your spark, karma. And it's a ball we held. There's a there's a advertisement uh, about this uh, that I that I always love. That uh, you give a negativity ball to somebody in the morning, and that ball is is given to somebody else. And by the end of the day, somebody gets that ball when they bring it home, and they bring it to their family. When we get rid of the butt and we add the the and, what we're doing is we're recognizing the appreciation and giving advice toward getting better, and thus creating a more positive future for everyone. I love that, man. I never thought of it from an NLP perspective, but uh, I was laughing. I was thinking if somebody, you know, scrubs forward in the podcast or tunes in when it's on radio and they tune in and they are, you got to have a butt jar, man. You got to have a butt jar. (laughs) It's out of context. (laughs) So (laughs) they need to rewind and listen. Let's move on because the A of the spark is alignment of values. And you already mentioned the brilliant story of Patagonia on Black Friday. It it really is about can connecting to what your constituents, customers, and employees want the most. And uh, Bo, Bo was talking to me about this. Bo is the, uh, the company that makes headsets. The uh, ex-CEO just left. We were in communication 
before the book, and I said, well, what do you think about this concept of emotional intelligence and values-based leading? And he said, this was, and and it's in the book. So the quote is in the book. I'm going to tell you what I took from what he wrote. There is no more important thing than emotionally connecting with your customers and their values. So you know, what do those customers value, truthfully? I mean, if you look at what they need and want and desire, and what they want is exceptional sound, and they want to be in their, the world of Bose, and they want it to be fine, really fine, um, something that is refined and fine, a, a great product that is on the higher end. It may cost a little more, and at the same time, notice I didn't say but, and at the same time, it also gives us this feeling, this perception that it is aligned with our personal values and our, how we value products. So identifying an unearthing value is the very first thing that should always happen with a customer, with employees even, people inside your company, because it's a that's the ecosystem of the world. Everything is about value and how we perceive our value. When you can connect those properly inside of a company to those with whom you lead and those with whom you serve, great things happen. Patagonia also has a great example here in the alignment of values because people who buy from Patagonia or work for Patagonia are not such fans of conspicuous consumption. During Black Friday, they created an advertisement, and that advertisement said, don't buy our products. There's too much conspicuous consumption. What happens as a result of that to, when, when they connect to the values of their customers at that time? Well, they're going to buy their product. And there was a great surge in sales during that season. And uh, that was largely because they connected to their values. There's another line I pulled here. You say, when organizations and executives bow to unrealistic pressure to perform Making decisions based on quarterly earnings over sustainable objectives, ensuring values are often brushed aside or forgotten. Such short-termism puts pressure on decision-making, on ethics, on emotional connectedness, on innovation, and of course on values. And this happens in so many businesses. People are guided by the pressures from above, and you give some great examples in the book. There's a lot of great examples of this. These are the examples that get on the front pages and and more and more people know it. Uh, One of my favorite examples is of an astronaut, Frank Borman, great astronaut, horrible CEO uh, of uh, Eastern Airlines. As you said in in the book, as you were quoting in the book, bowing to pressures of quarterly earnings because let's just say he had to reduce overhead because they were doing horribly in the airline industry, as were a lot of other airlines at the time. And there were picketers and thousands of them outside Eastern Airlines. And he gave a speech to them that was projected in all the major news media at the time. And he said, tomorrow, if you don't come to work and vote no to becoming part of your union, you will be voting on your jobs. (laughs) Nice. So <laughs> what a great way to evoke respect from your employees. Yeah. So what happened to Eastern Airlines? Uh, I don't see them anymore when I'm taking flights from New York to San Francisco to, to, to you <laughs> or anywhere around the world for that matter. They went bankrupt. Chapter 11, man. They went belly up. The key to a great leader and CEO is doing that right thing amidst great pressure. And it it could be a simple thing like what Howard Bahar and Schultz did with that individual had AIDS and giving him health care when they didn't have the money. Whereas you have examples like Frank Borman, really great astronaut, really bad CEO, because he made his people on the picket lines vote for their jobs. He had the choice to allow a union to become vibrant, which would have saved his airline, or have people vote in their jobs and losing most of the workforce. So when you have that choice, making the right strategic move toward helping individuals and being kind toward human beings works. So we've covered OR, which is respect, which is Howard Schultz and people in organizations. But the last one I'd love to cover today is killer achievement, which is the K of the Spark model. Killer achievements and killer outcomes really connect everything together because it, it, if you don't have some sort of metric for what, why things connect us, 
or why we are connected. We really can't get anywhere. We can't set people up to succeed, right? So when we continue to train people, develop people, and we connect it to a result of a company, this may be through AT&T, who is going through talent transformations, who partnered with Udacity and Georgia Tech, who provided online courses and blended learning for 140,000 employees, right? That culture on demand of ongoing learning. And when you continue that ongoing learning, you're finding the people who are your greatest leaders. One of the number one attributes of a great, great leader in our research is that they are most open to continuous learning and they're always sponges. They're reading a lot. They're finding a lot. They're seeking out information. They're always trying to get better and they're always playing to win. So it's about creating a sense of urgency around that, a feeling that you must win. And the companies that really get to that place of must winning because this is our only chance and we don't have another another chance at it, while also knowing that failure can bring us learnings where we can get better the next time and we can understand how to approach it better as well. Like Big River Steel, their think big goal to reinvent what it means to be a great steel company. That drove the steel startup to have huge waves out of the gate. 2014, it was the biggest economic development project in Arkansas, right? They were EBITDA positive in the second month of operation. And it's the only steel operation to ever have LEED certified for safety. Huge killer outcomes, right? Hey, look at what Volvo did. By 2020, no one, no one should be killed or injured in a new Volvo car. Who says that? We know companies that don't, companies that bow to the pressures of our quarterly earnings. Volvo said, by 2020, no one should be killed or injured in a new Volvo car. And they pledged to become a $125 billion company by 2000. Did it. SpaceX's vision, enabling human exploration, did it. This is, is be best or bust. That's what it's about. Where can people find out more about you and your work and more about the book that's full of frameworks, full of ways to find your own values, questions to ask yourself as a leader or a wannabe leader, et cetera, et cetera. Where can people find out? You could go to my website, lewiscarter.com, or go to my company. It's called Best Practice Institute. You'll find out stuff on there. So yeah, that's me. Author of In Great Company, How to Spark Peak Performance by Creating an Emotionally Connected Workplace, Lewis Carter, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.